Um, yes, thank you. Good morning or good afternoon to you. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to talk here today about the work that I've done for the last four years um, with virtual fencing technology for beef cattle. Um, this is work that I have done at CSIRO, which is in Armidale in New South Wales in Australia. Um, we've also done work on commercial, other commercial farms around Australia. And I just wanted to acknowledge upfront that it is um, work of a team. So I've been working with Dr. Caroline Lee, and then we have excellent technicians who have assisted with um, many aspects of the projects, Jim Lee and Troy Kalinowski, and couldn't have done the work without them. Um, so for the presentation today, I will first give a bit of background on what is the virtual fencing technology that we've been working with. Um, I will then present some findings from the research that we have done both um, on site at CSIRO's, so we have a research farm, um, and then also um, on other commercial farms within Australia. And then finally, I'll talk about um, the work we've done to try and understand the behavior and the welfare impacts of the technology. So when you're looking to um, roll something out commercially and implement it for livestock, you want to be sure that you are really matching the technology with what the animal does, so that it doesn't have any negative impacts on them. So what is virtual fencing? Um, this, hang on, I was just gonna, do I need to move this or hide thumbnail view? Maybe that's better. Um, so virtual fencing, it is um, you're containing cattle without the use of any fixed fence. And so the way you're doing it is the animal is wearing a neckband device and you are providing signals to the animal to communicate where the fence is. And in the case of the technology that we've been using, this is an audio tone and an electrical stimulus. And the audio tone acts as a warning to the animal, and then it is followed by the electrical stimulus if they don't stop when they receive that warning tone. And so the animals, they rapidly learn to avoid this virtual fence line based on just this audio tone alone. So they, they learn that this warning means an electric stimulus or electric shock is following and they can stop and turn around based on the audio cue. So they actually learn um, to, to stop and then avoid receiving um, more electrical stimuli. And so as you can imagine, if it is this virtual fence where you don't have to set up miles of fence line, then there are a lot of applications for it. So you might have greater control of your grazing animals and you might be able to optimize um, the pasture within your property. Um, you also have this increased ability to monitor your animals. So all of the animals, while they're wearing this neck bands, it's operated by a, um, GPS. So you've got GPS tracking of them so you can always see where they are. Uh, you can also protect environmentally sensitive areas, and this might be coupled with difficult terrain where you might not normally be able to put up physical fences. And it could also reduce costs um, for you know, monitoring the animals or mustering them in or the labor associated with putting up the fences. And then I'd just like to clarify that um, the technology is generally assumed to be used for internal sets of fences. So you probably wouldn't use it as say a hard fence next to um, a highway or something. Um, you would want it and mostly just for internal fences. So just a, a demonstration here of the virtual fencing system. So you would have a, a, a paddock area and this is obviously very simplified for you here. Um, you would set a virtual fence line so that you have what we call an inclusion zone where you want the animals to be and an exclusion zone where you don't want them to be. And when they're in the inclusion zone, they don't receive any signals at all from these devices. But as they approach this virtual boundary, they get an audio cue is played from the neckband device. And if they keep moving forward towards that boundary, then it'll also be followed by this electrical pulse. If the animal actually crosses this barrier and they, they go into the exclusion zone, then the, the neck band recognizes their, their position that they've gone over the line and it still provides signals to them. So as they move further and further into this exclusion zone, they will still be getting this audio tone followed by an electrical pulse um, repeatedly as they move deeper into it. And so this functions then to turn the animals around and to get them back out where you want them to go. So as they turn around and they start heading back into the inclusion zone, then they are no longer receiving any signals. And so just a, a little bit of history of 
the virtual fencing. So CSIRO developed patents for this technology um, about 15 years ago. Um, so they have uh, worldwide patents on them. And then Addresons, they are a startup company that are based in, in Melbourne, in Victoria, in Australia. So they became the exclusive licensees for these patents. And they are the ones that are commercializing this product, which they call the eShepherd. So there are, there are other products out there. Um, so there is no fence, which has been developed in Norway, and that's mostly been applied to goats at this point. Um, and there are other companies. Um, I think there is Vents, which is um, located in California, as far as I know. And there's also another company in New Zealand. Um, I have not seen any of their products or had experience with them, so I cannot comment on them. I don't know at what stage of the commercialization process they are at. Um, we have been working with Adjacens. Um, they are due to have a, a soft commercial release this year and that they have selected farms that they are setting up their system on. Um, obviously, like everything else with COVID, things have been slowed down a bit, uh, but they are, are fairly close to having a product out there. And this is the, this is the product that we have been using. Um, and, and as I said, this company is the exclusive licensee to the technology. Um, so just with that, they because they're commercially developing um, a lot of the more technical questions, which I imagine um, you, you might have, uh, are best placed um, or directed towards them. So on their website, addresons.com, you can um, ask them ask them questions about the technology if you're interested um, in the potential for using it. Um, so I'll be talking about the research that we've done and just the way that the device works in terms of relationship with the animal but any really specific technical questions about how it functions are best directed um, towards them. So a photo of the neckband device here. Um, so it's, it's something that is worn by the animal. It sits on the back of their neck. So you have this adjustable strap and there's a hanging counterweight down the bottom to keep it in place. Um, it has solar panels, so it is self charges. You get it, there's a speaker which plays the audio tone, and then you have um, electrodes which are in contact with the animal's skin to deliver that electrical pulse. And this device communicates with a base station that is set up on the farm. And I'll just go through to this next um, schematic here. So, as I said, the animal wears a neckband, um, and every animal should wear one, um, based on what we've what we've seen. Uh, this uh, communicates via GPS. So all your animals are, are tracked by GPS technology. This neckband communicates with a base station, which is set up on your property. Uh, if you have a very, very large property, you may be more than one base station. Um, all the information, it goes to a cloud database and you can talk to the neckbands and watch your animals and set fences and just everything that you need to do can be done via a, a computer or smartphone or, or tablet. So it, once this is set up, you could, you could be monitoring or moving your animals really from anywhere in the world because it's then all gone online. Um, you need like 3G, 4G coverage to um, have this base station, but the base station talks to the collars or the, the neckbands via a, a radio frequency link um, Laura link, so that that does not require coverage for the base station to be able to communicate. Just the base station itself would need um, a 4G, 3G coverage. And, and the range for the base station, um, it, if you've got really clear terrain, like what we um, presented in this picture here, then theoretically it's up to like 10 to 15 kilometers, um, I don't know what that is in miles. Um, but if it's more difficult to rain, then that would be reduced. Just something that would um, hinder a signal being transmitted would just reduce the range of what your base station can transmit. So then the research that I've been doing for the last four years, this was a, a large scale government funded project. Um, it involved many uh, university partners as well as CSIRO and CSIRO is a government um, research institution. And we were all looking at different aspects of it. So Cyro focused on trying to understand how the animal responds to this technology um, so that we could um, understand what the applications of it might be, what the limitations of it might be, and as well as refining the technology. So we were working very closely with Adjacens in their development of the product. And so our research helped to show 
you know, where they might need to refine the, the algorithm to ensure that the animals are getting trained properly and being kept where they're meant to be kept. Um, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, the welfare impacts. So just to make sure that there's not any negative impacts on the animal's well-being so that you're not then um, implementing a technology that's going to say decrease your productivity or have um, consequences for the animals. Um, there is more information on this overall study available at this, um, this website link that I've placed down here below. Um, and the partners uh, did look at the virtual fencing technology for um, beef cattle, dairy cattle, sheep, and then also um, social acceptance and producer adoption of it. So to just now go into um, some examples of the research that uh, we have done, some of the trials that we've done. Um, this one was conducted on site at CSIRO, and this is one of the early trials that we did with just a small group of six animals with um, the first prototypes of these devices. And this was, this was our moving fence trial. And, and we set this up because we wanted to understand how the animals respond if you were to move that virtual fence. So as I said earlier, the fence line is communicated to the animals via these this audio tone, so something that they hear, and then um, an electrical pulse or something negative that would make them stop and turn away. Um, this is different, obviously, to a standard electric fence where the animal can see it. So they see it, they touch it, and then they learn to avoid that thing that they're seeing. So it's the same principles, but in this case, the animal is hearing something rather than seeing. But the, one of the benefits of virtual fences is that you can set it up temporarily. And if the animal is not only listening to that tone, but they are also then picking up their own visual cues in the environment. So they're saying, oh, look, I always get that audio tone right near that, that giant tree in the paddock. Then they might be learning to avoid something visual as well as auditory, but you don't want that if you want the ability to have temporary virtual fencing. So that was what this trial was designed to do, is to try and see whether the animals would um, move into a new area if you moved that virtual fence. So we set up this paddock where they had access, and this was um, approximately six hectare paddock, so it was just something small. We set the animals up and they had access to all of the area um, just to get used to using the whole paddock area. We then set up a virtual fence line that reduced the area and excluded them to only 40% of the available paddock. So they were only allowed to access this 40% area. And then after approximately a week, we shifted so that they had access now to 60% of the area. Then we shifted it again so they had access to 80% of the paddock. And then we thought just to try and really confuse them, we would shift the virtual fence line this way. So now they just had access to half of the paddock, but lengthways. And these are the GPS tracking plots of the animal movement. So you can see that initially they do access this entire paddock area. We set this and this is what we would call uh, the training period. So this is where they are learning what this means. They're learning that the audio tone means that an electrical pulse is following and that they are supposed to stop when they hear that audio tone. So you can see initially they do cross over during that learning period, but you can see across time this reduces. And for the majority of time, the animals are staying where we want them to, um, but they're also accessing this new area that's been exposed. Um, and, and also when that fence line was shift lengthways, they, they did really well with it and they, they stayed exactly where they were meant to. And we saw that the animals had learned that the fence had moved in, in under four hours. So it was less than four hours and they were already accessing that new area. So this was really positive for the um, potential for virtual fencing to be temporary. Um, and this might be if you're setting something up um, to exclude them from a particular area of pasture or particular um, sensitive area or um, for strip grazing um, purposes. And if anyone is interested in more detail on this study, then it is available as um, an open access publication so anyone can have access to it online. Then one of the next trials we did, this was um, our first one that we did in a commercial property. So this was a riparian zone property in New South Wales. And this is a, a map view of the property where the black 
outline here is, is all the area that the animals had access to when we hadn't set up any fences. So you can see there is this river running through the property and the animals were able to cross over this river and go and access um, land across the river. So we had a group of 11 cattle uh, with this trial and we gave them, they were, they were naive to this paddock, so they were, they were not familiar with it. We put them in and gave them a couple of weeks to get used to the area. Um, and then we set up this virtual fence line, which cut off their access to this, this river area. And they were kept within this area highlighted with the yellow, which was um, approximately three hectare area. Um, and then we um, deactivated the fence line so that they had free access again. And here, um, these are GPS plots similar to what I showed before. And you can see here there is no virtual fence. This is their initial movement patterns. And you can see that they crossed over the river and they were accessing the, the paddock area beyond the river. We set up a virtual fence for 10 days. And you can see that it keeps them within that area for the majority of the time. Um, about three days into it, we had a group of four cattle that did cross over. Um, this was for about 30 minutes until um, the algorithm turned them around and got them back to the group. And as I said before, once they cross over, they're still receiving signals from this device. It's not like um, an electric dog color for, or yeah, electric color for dogs, where once they cross over that boundary, then you know they're they're on the other side and they they still get signals when they try to come back. The difference with this is that it recognizes they've crossed over, and it effectively shifts that line so that it, the line is always in, in front of them. So that every time they try and move deeper into the zone, it, it's still giving them signals to turn them around. And then we deactivated this fence and you can see that the animals then accessed this area and they also access additional area. They, they learned that they could go over the river um, the other way and access all this additional area beyond. So you can see it has a, a, a temporary application and it was able to exclude them from this area that they, or this resource that they wanted to access. So prior to us putting the fence, they were drinking from this river and they were accessing it daily. Um, we obviously gave them drinking water when we had the virtual fence up, but they were still quite highly motivated to go down to that, that river, um, but the virtual fence was able to stop them. And again, there are more details of this in a, a publication that is available online. And th then one of the, um, the next studies that we did, this was conducted in South Australia. And this was to look at the ability of the virtual fencing technology to protect an area of regenerating saplings. So there was a 14 hectare paddock and we had 20 cattle for this. And in addition to protecting them from these saplings, we wanted to see um, about a contoured fence line. So you can see from the other um, experiments that I presented, we always used a straight virtual fence line. And in the earlier versions of the technology, that was all it could do. Is just make a straight line uh, but as the technology improves it can it can make a contoured line so it can it can follow around areas more and so with this we put the animals in and we initially gave them straight lines because we weren't sure how they would respond to something contoured and then across a progression of fence lines we gradually made it more and more contoured until um, the red line here in front of this um, hashed area it follows directly around the saplings. And this line was kept up for, uh, well, the whole trial lasted for 44 days. And I can show you the GPS plots here of the cattle movement. So these are the first few days um, or the first two weeks of the trial. And then these are listed by week after. And you can see that they respond very well. These are animals that had never had any experience with this technology. You can see that they're kept out of the sapling area. You do have some that, that cross over temporarily. Um, there was a little bit more crossing over in, in week three. Um, but overall, these it because the GPS is recording every few seconds, it, it looks like a lot of movement. Um, but once we analyze the data across the trial, the animals spent um, in total across the 44 days, um, less than 20 minutes on average within that zone. Um, you can see on week six here, there is a, a lot of activity in there. And, and we looked back at the data and this was due to a couple of animals that had um, 
poor contact with the collars. So they were receiving all these pulses, but they probably actually weren't feeling them. And the, the design of the device has since been modified um, to ensure that it will always have contact with the animal skin. Um, so that was more a device malfunction rather than the animals not, um, not responding or, or listening to the technology. And then I just wanted to present a couple of graphs here um, to illustrate what we saw in this trial, but also what has been similar across all the trials that we have done, where um, this is showing a count of the cues the animals receive. And by cues, I mean the audio tones that they get, as well as that electric pulse or electric shock. And so the, the electric shocks are indicated in, in red, you know, or the darker, and the, the audio tones are in the paler, the orange. And this is just across the length of the trial. So what you can see here is that the animals, the, the orange is larger than the red. So the animals are responding to that audio tone alone. Um, so there, there's a lot of times where they are interacting with that fence. They're receiving just that audio cue and they're turning back around. So they are um, receiving fewer pulses than audio tones, indicating that they are learning um, how to appropriately respond to this technology. And you can also see that um, almost every day across the trial, they were interacting with that fence. So they're not, they're, they're not touching it first and then staying away from it. And you can see in those GPS plots, they're grazing right up to that line and they're um, responding to the cues when they hear them. Um, there's obviously a spike here, um, but again, that was um, those animals which had devices that were not, um, didn't have proper contact with their skin. And this is a similar graph here, but I've just done this by individual animal. So again, your orange are the audio cues and um, the red are the electrical pulses. Um, again, you've got these spikes, those are the animals. Um, I mean, it's reading that they're receiving several hundred um, electrical pulses, um, but in reality, they weren't feeling those. But what you do see is that every animal does interact with a fence line, but to varying degrees. So there is, and we see this consistently across our trials, that there is individual variation in, in how the animals respond, both how quickly they learn and how often they will go back to that fence and, and test it out. And this here is um, a plot of some of the pasture measurements we took in that trial. And you can see um, the dark just indicates more pasture. So you can see that the animals were, were grazing right up to it, e eating that grass. Um, we, we eventually moved them out of the paddock because they had run out of feed in it, but they were still uh, avoiding what was quite nice lush grass there. So we, we showed the animals could be kept from this sensitive area. Um, the saplings remained undamaged across the trial, and they were also able to respond to this contoured line that followed around the area. And again, more information is available in this online if you wish to read up on it. And then the final trial that we did was to try and understand, as I said, the, the impacts, um, welfare behavior impacts of this. So this is particularly important for several factors for producers that want to make sure it has no negative impact on the animals. Um, social acceptance of the technology, given that it's using electrical pulses, and also legislation. So currently, um, this device is not able to be used in all Australian states. Um, not every state um, legalizes the use of these electric shocks on the animals. Um, and this is, is likely going to be changed, but the people that are um, deciding about these legislations, they would want to know that this is not something that is going to significantly harm the animals before they say that this is allowed on all animals in Australia. So we conducted this trial with um, 64 animals split into groups and we compared um, the use of a virtual fence versus electric tape, which is um, pretty standard to use on farms. Um, we did four groups of animals first and then we did a second four groups of animals. And just a, a brief overview of the timeline um, that we put the animals in the paddock and we used um, GPS devices to track where they went ice cubes, which are automated commercially available devices that look at the behavior of the animals, such, such as the lying and standing time. We did body weight measurements. And then we took fecal samples to look at stress hormone metabolites. And then we activated or placed the fences at um, week number two in the paddock. And these, we repeated this sampling um, protocol throughout the trial of taking regular um, samples of the animals, and then we repeated it with a second cohort. 
just some quick results here. Uh, what we saw, uh, this is a, a display of the standing and lying time. So obviously it's important for the cattle to have um, the right amount of lying time. Um, and we wouldn't want to see that they have significantly reduced lying time because they might be um, stressed with this technology in place. And this is, um, I guess, a fairly detailed graph. Um, up the top is the electric tape and down the bottom is the virtual fence. Um, across the weeks of the trial. And uh, the, the overall summary here is that um, there were different patterns across time, different patterns between um, the two groups of animals that, that we used, um, the two cohorts, but they were quite similar between the electric tape and the virtual fence. There was slightly reduced lying time in the virtual fence group, but it equated to about 20 minutes or less per day. So we are unsure if longer term that would have any negative impact. Um, it was statistically significant, but it might not actually be biologically relevant for the animals. We'd need to do something much longer term to um, be sure of that. And the stress hormone metabolites, um, electric tape on the top, virtual fence down here, Across time, there's a clear um, reduction in the metabolites, um, but no differences between the groups. So we concluded that um, there were minimal differences in terms of behavior and welfare impacts. And this more detail is available this online. So what we know is that the technology, it works across different situations, we've applied it. Um, we haven't found major welfare impacts to date, but we have seen clear individual variations in how the animals respond. We need longer term trials, so six months or more, to really understand if there are any impacts longer term, um, using different breeds of animals to see if you get different responses, um, and also some more challenging terrain. So most of our paddocks are being quite small and quite open. Um, so just seeing how the animals respond if you have um, a more challenging um, paddock terrain. And that is it, and I would be happy to take any questions that you may have. You have, you have two, and a, two and a half minutes for questions. Yeah, and you have a lot of questions as we figured you would for this topic. Um, you There were questions about animal welfare and you just addressed that. So I'm gonna assume that that took care of those questions. Um, and one of the other questions I saw was um, talking about topography and how much of a terrain um, would work with the fence. With the virtual fence? Yeah, so it, it would just come down to base stations, really. Um, so if you do have a lot of, if you have, um, say, if in mountains or a lot of trees, heavily wooded area, that would block the, the radio signal going from the base station to the neck band, then you just might need to erect more base stations on your property. Um, so, so Adjacents are running trials as well, um, independently as a commercial company, they're running trials. And so they have done trials with much larger numbers of animals for longer periods of time. They obviously have access to um, more devices than we do. Um, so they have put devices on several hundred animals and kept them for, for months at a time. Um, and they, they have done some where they've got some tree area, um, but we haven't done trials with really mountainous terrain at this point. Okay. Um, one of the other questions I know I saw in here was, um, do you use any visual boundaries while you're establishing a new exclusion zone? No, so no, they, they learn really quickly with this audio tone, like some animals, it just takes a couple of times, like it, it's really fast. Um, and to have a visual signal in there as well, and then to remove that, it, it would, would be too complicated, it would, it would confuse them because ultimately you just want them to know about their audio tone and, and they do it really well. They're, they're really good at it. It's amazing how fast they learn. Maybe the last one, um, somebody is asking about, do you have plans to try to collar just a subset of the dominant animal, animals and see if that keeps the rest of the herd from strain? Maybe you don't have to collar the whole herd and still get okay control. Yeah, so at this point we say doing all of them. Um, so we haven't found a particular relationship between dominance. Um, we certainly find that some animals will touch the fence more than the others. And we have shown that they will learn from each other. We have some more work showing the social facilitation of it. Um, but if an animal, because you've got such a strong social pull between cattle, if you've got some that cross over for whatever reason, it, it's going to try and drag those others over and if they've got functioning devices and they're going to be getting these electric shocks but they want to be with their cattle mates it's it's a lot of confusion um in a really large group of animals then it might be you know several days or a week before every animal has actually experienced that fence line 
Um, but at this point, just to ensure the safety of the animals, we recommend that they all have that fence or that net band on so that they're all getting that fence line.